So I'm going to introduce a combinatorial matrix that I call Tropical Laplacian and introduce one conjecture and explain uh, how it goes and also give a general introduction to this set of conjectures called low concavity conjectures and to give you the impression what the conjectures are about and how what the interesting facts about it and to prepare the following talk by Karim Adiprasito at March 3 where he made a recent great advance on the set of conjectures. So, one of my aim is to introduce this conjecture, which is a purely combinatorial statement that I'll make precise later. So it says that the tropical Laplacian of a matroid has exactly one negative eigenvalue. So before defining the tropical Laplacian or matroid, anything like that, let me show you an example. So one e feature of this conjecture or the interesting aspect of this conjecture is that even if you start with a, what you think would be a really, really trivial example, it's not so easy to verify the conclusion of the conjecture. So let's consider a finite set that I'll always not by E. Let's say it has five elements, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And the matroid in this case will be a uniform matroid of rank 4, but let's you don't really need to know that at this moment. And let's consider the graph G, uh, which is a bipartite graph. On subsets of E, having size 3 and size 2. And they are connected by an edge whenever one is contained in the other. So there are 10 plus 10 vertices of these, this bipartite graph, and there are a lot of edges between them. And this graph is highly uniform. For example, if you look at the vertex corresponding to the subset 0, 1, 2, it has exactly three neighbors corresponding to 0, 1, 0, 2, and 1, 2. And same for all the other upper vertices. And for lower vertices, say for example, if you pick a one on the corresponding to 3, 4, then it also has three neighbors, 0, 3, 4, 1, 3, 4, and 2, 3, 4, etc. So this is a regular, three regular bipartite graph. And associated to this graph, I'm going to define a symmetric, real symmetric matrix, L of M. Here, M stands for the matroid behind the picture, which is the uniform matroid, defined by the following rule. So this is a 20 by 20 symmetric matrix, where rows and columns are indexed by the vertices, 10 plus 10 on your graph. And the entry is 0 if i is, ij is not an edge, and minus 1 if ij is an edge, or vertex i and j are connected by an edge, and all the diagonal entries are 2. So normally in the in the spectral graph theory, the diagonal entries you would put here would be three because every vertex has three neighbors and all the diagonal entries should be the degree. Here I put two, so in other words, what I have wrote here, Lm, or the tropical Laplacian of M, is the usual graph Laplacian.
minus 20 by 20 identity matrix. So, and here the proposition is that this matrix has exactly one negative eigenvalue. and four zero eigenvalues. So because of the expression written here, the, what I've said here is equivalent to showing that the usual graph Laplacian, or the, this graph, has a spectral gap one. But it appears that proving such a statement is not so easy. So I have tried a few well-known bounds on spectral gaps, and they're seem to be not good enough to yell this bound. So for this statement, um, I know two methods of proof. And both are, in some sense, quite very far from being satisfactory. So the first method requires a lot of patience. and you type in this 20 by 20 matrix carefully into computer and press enter. And you see all the eigenvalues. And just to make sure you type enter again and again and again, make sure. If, if, if. So, and I, I have done that once, and it works. And the second, second method is to start from this matroid M and using the fact that this combinatorial structure is in fact realizable as an algebraic variety in some sense. And you construct this algebraic variety. And you apply certain Hobbes theory here and get the conclusion. And this is also somewhat not satisfactory. I mean, this is a very small matroid and it's the simplest non-trivial matroid though depending how you define simplest. So I would be very interested in how to prove this proposition in an intelligent way, not via proof one nor proof two. So I have become interested in the statement written there, conjecture A, because of this set of conjectures called low concavity and unimodality conjectures in combinatorics. So the associated names are Reed, Hogar, Welsh, Mason, Rota, Heron, and probably some more. And they made essentially the same sort of conjecture again and again in seemingly different way. So all, all these conjectures asserts that a certain sequence arising from combinatorics is unimodal, meaning that your sequence is of the form this for some k or low concave. This means that a k square is greater than or equal to a k minus 1, a k plus 1. So in all the relevant situations, your sequence is in fact a sequence of positive integers and in that case low concavity implies unimodality. So Reed conjectured that some sequence is unimodal and Hogarth strengthened it to low concave and Welsh made that certain sequence is unimodal and then Mason strengthened it to this, this low concave, etc. So it turns out that the correct generality to work on and the correct statement to should, that should be proved is the second statement in these cases rather than the first one. 
So one very good source of examples of unimodal and low concave sequences comes from the cohomology of a projective algebraic variety known as the Talib package. Here, of course, so if you have a sequence like AI, then you say that sequence is low concave if this inequality holds for all index k. Not the same k. So this is for some k. This is for all k. AI. <laughs> yeah. No, the other way. If you have a positive numbers, which is satisfies this inequality for all index, then for some index k, you have this. But you, you really do need positivity, not non-negativity doesn't work. One zero 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 one is low concave. <laughs> That's right. Oh integer is not necessary. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll t I'll tell you. Yeah. I'll tell you some examples. So here you have a positive decomposition, and in addition you have hard lecture theorem, which is a very good source of unimodal sequences. And in fact, unimodal and symmetric sequences. So this is the part that was used in Stanley's proof of G theorem on the face numbers of simple or simplicial polytops. And there's a second part known as the Hodge-Riemann relations. And it roughly says that the, the primitive part of the cohomology, if you look at the intersection forms, it has a fixed sign. And the main idea for approaching low concavity conjectures by algebraic geometry method is that this produces concave sequences. So I'll not really go into the algebraic geometry of Keller variety or cohomology of color manifolds, but uh, the effect of such very strong theorems that you can see in at the very elementary level. So the example of this second theorem producing low concave sequences from the Hodge-Riemann relations uh, comes from the geometry of convex bodies. So if you write a i for the i next volume of convex bodies, say delta 1 and delta 2. And this is by definition the coefficient of x i in the polynomial volume of x delta 1 plus delta 2. Then in fact such a sequence AI is low concave. So if you have given a, any two convex bodies in Rn and you take the Minkowski sum with one indeterminate and you compute the volume for all such Minkowski sums. And that turns out to be a polynomial in one variable x and you read off the coefficient. So it starts with, the polynomial starts with the volume of delta 1 and ends with the volume of delta 2, and there are indeterminates. So in this context, the Hodge-Riemann relation is known as the alexander fengchell inequalities. 
and it says that for all index k, you have this. Yes, it's a certain toric variety. You can work with any toric variety that supports the normal bands of delta 1 and delta 2, assuming that they are polytopes. You, first, you prove the polytope case, and you approximate convex bodies with polytopes. And to really convince you that this corresponds to that, let me tell you somewhat lesser known fact about the Alexander Venturlin curve P. So, this is known as Sheppard's construction. And it says the following. If you give me a low concave sequence of positive real numbers, say a0, a1, dot, 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 an, then there are convex bodies, delta 1 and delta 2, inside all to the n, such that ai is the ice mixed volume of delta 1 and delta 2. So low concave positive sequences are exactly the sequence of integers that you can get as mixed volume of two convex bodies. From an algebraic geometer's point of view, what's interesting about this construction is that even if you're given a positive low concave sequence of integers, you cannot construct convex bodies delta 1, delta 2 as integral polytopes. You can construct it as a rational polytope. And general, there are examples showing that you cannot do that. So, AI should be positive. So uh, I'll introduce some of the conjectures associated to the names of, written there. And the most basic version concerns a graph with finite in many vertices. And this time you look at this polynomial, one variable polynomial in indeterminate Q called the chromatic polynomial. And this polynomial is defined by the property that its value at positive integer q is the number of proper colorings of g with q colors. So here you're coloring the vertices of g using q colors in such a way that whenever two vertices are connected by an edge, you have to use two different colors. And it turns out that this really is a polynomial, and furthermore with integral coefficients. And the conjecture, let's write conjecture B. I'll write, I'll go in only to label conjecture, so A and that's B, and read for unimodality and Hogar for low concavity is that the coefficients of chi g q form a low concave sequence. for any g. So 
it's actually quite pleasant to see that a statement as universal as this, supposed to hold for all finite graphs, are non-trivial to prove. Um, here's the second conjecture, which is, in fact, almost the same conjecture. So this time, you start with the collection A, say, in a vector space V over field K. So this is a finite subset of a vector space V over your favorite field K. And you define a sequence indexed by k associated to this finite collection of vectors in V with the number of k elements independent subsets of A. So here, independent simply means the linear independence of vectors. In this case, conjecture C, Welsh for unimodality and Mason for low concavity, is that FKA forms a low concave sequence for any configuration of vectors A and any vector space V over any field K. So this is again quite strong statement. But what makes, in my opinion, what makes these conjectures truly interesting is their defining characteristic in the sense that these are, in a very strong sense, additive invariants of a graph or a configuration. So in the sense that how would you compute the chromatic polynomial of a graph when given a graph? And the only natural thing you can do is to pick a match and form two new graphs. Here E is one of the edges of your graph. And this is the graph uh, that you obtain by deleting the chosen edge E. And the second is obtained by contracting the chosen edge E. And then what you observe is that the number of ways to color G using Q colors is exactly the difference of the following types. And this recursion actually defines chromatic polynomial and it actually shows that chromatic polynomial is a polynomial and it has integer coefficients at both sides. Same for the conjecture C here. So how would you compute the fk or the f vector of the configuration? You pick one of the vectors in your arrangement A and form two new arrangements. So the first is obtained by, same as before, deleting the chosen vector E from your arrangement. And the second is arrangement living in one smaller dimensional vector space that you obtain by projecting the rest of the vectors from E. And how do you compute the number of k-element independent sets? Well, there are two kinds. k-element independent sets containing E and not containing E. And each one of them corresponds to terms like this.
And this is interesting. So what you can actually show is that both of these numbers are manifestation of the same invariant, which is kind of universal Euler characteristic. This additivity is their defining characteristic. On the other hand, these conjectures here are not preserved under sums. If they were, we had the proof, but they are not. And in fact, they almost never do unless something miraculous things happen. So if you add two unimodal or low concave sequences in general, you don't get it. You get that only under very special circumstances, for example, for low concavity, the peak of this unimodal sequence lies almost coincides with the peak of this and that. So th these sort of substructures associated to this combinatorial structures are called minors. And the conjecture, in effect, predicts that if you look at these sequences associated to all its minors, then their peaks are al aligned under some does not vary too much. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to show you the invariant behind those two, and it's called the characteristic polynomial. Of a matroid. So I'll not dwell on the definition of the matroid, but if you're not already familiar with the concept of matroid, just think of this situation. Matroid is a certain collection of subsets of a given finite set that you would call independent sets that satisfy all the known axioms from the linear independence of vectors. For example, the exchange axiom. So let's say you have a matroid say without loops. In the graph case, no loop means no loop. And in the vector case, no loop means that your arrangement does not contain zero vector. And then out of this, you can construct a certain pole set. This is the, in fact, a lattice. And it's a lattice consisting of flats of M. So if you think of matroid as a collection of vectors, flats are exactly those sets, maximal within given rank. So it's an intersection of A with subspaces of B. And dually, if you think of, this might be easier, if you think of A as a collection of hyperplanes in B, arrangement of hyperplanes, then flats are literally flats, intersection of hyperplanes in your hyperplane arrangement. And as with any post set, you can think of the Mabius function. So this is a function mu defined on my lattice of flats, which is in fact a specialization of the two variable Mabius function. And it's defined by saying that the mu of the empty set is 1. And for all others, it's defined recursively by the formula this. So the smallest element has value 1. 
and to compute the value at x, you look at all the smaller elements than x, where mu is already defined, and you set the new value to be by this form. And out of that data, you can define the characteristic polynomial of your matroid M as a sum over all elements in your lattice of flats and of the following form. Mu x of rank M minus rank So rank of M is the cardinality of maximal independent sets, cardinality of bases, and X has a rank, being a flat, the cardinality of maximal independent subsets in X. So let's try one easy example of computing the Mabius function and the characteristic polynomial. So my m is pictorially given by four points in projective plane, three collinear, say so labeled by 0, 1, 2, 3. Or equivalently, when viewed as a hyperplane arrangement in P2, it's given by this arrangement of lines in P2. So in this case, my lattice of flats has rank 1 element, 0, 1, 2, 3, lying above the empty set. And the rank 2 flats are 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and 1, 2, 3. And I have my top element. So that's my post set. Flats are 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and 1, 2, 3. Those are the non-trivial flats. And to compute the Mabius function, you start by assigning 1 to the smallest element. And compute here, you look at lowest element and assign it so that it becomes the sum is 0. Same here, same here, same here. To compute mu at 0, 1, you look at this, this, this. And if you sum up to 0, then you have to assign 1 here, 1 here, 1 here, and back 2 here because it has 3 lower elements. And here you should also assign 2, minus 3. And what you do to compute the characteristic polynomial, you add the coefficients along each rank. So pi and q. Is a cubic polynomial that starts with q to the power of 3 that corresponds to here and minus 4q squared plus 5q and minus 2. And the assertion of, for example, conjecture b or c is that 5 squared is larger than 4 times 2. Here are some more interesting examples or a collection of examples so which explains the connection with the previous conjectures. So if you start with a graph, then you can construct an associated matroid on the set of edges of your graph. You say that the collection of edges of G is dependent if it contains a cycle. Otherwise, it's independent. 
and it defines the choice. So if you compute the chromatic polynomial of G in the previous sense, then it's related to the characteristic polynomial of its associated matroid by the following formula. Q to the power of number of connected components and this. So the low concavity for this and that are the, actually the same assertion. And the second, if you have a uh, arrangement of central hyperplanes in FQ to the N, so FQ is a finite field with Q elements, and you look at the vector space over that. And suppose you have a bunch of central hyperplanes, meaning that hyperplanes containing zero. So co-dimension one subspaces of F and Q. And again, this defines a matroid. Each hyperplane defines a vector in dual space, and you say that they are dependent when they are linearly dependent. And if you count the number of points in F and Q minus A, then this is Q to the N minus rank of M times pi of a M of a Q. So in this example, Q was, wasn't really a variable. Q is an actual number. But uh, in order to really recover the characteristic polynomial, you can start with the arrangement defined over the integers, and you specialize to every prime P. Then you show that except for finitely many primes, these are, there are, all the others are good reductions in the sense that they don't change the combinatorial type or the associated matroid M. And for all such good reduction, if you put Q, then you get the number of points. Yes, yes. Yes. Ah, that's right. <laughs> So you can do something similar over the complex numbers. So if you have the same arrangement of central hyperplanes in Cn, and then if you compute the class in the Grothendieck ring of varieties of this complement of hyperplane arrangement, then what you get is class of affine line n minus rank of m and then chi m evaluated at p. And over the complex numbers, you also have some pleasant equalities type. If you compute the i singular homology Betti numbers of Cn minus A, that's the ice coefficient. Of Cn minus A. So now you could believe my assertion that this chi m is really a universal additive invariant, at least when applied to objects like m or hyperplane arrangements. And there are several interesting observations that you can extract out of this. For example, here, because given combinatorial type M, there are many, many different ways of realizing M by choosing hyperplanes A. 
So no matter which realization you choose, the varieties themselves are very far from being isomorphic, but its class in the group and the green is the same. And its single homology, homology beta numbers are the same. But for example, the fundamental group of Cn minus A will very much depend on which realization you have picked. Homology beta numbers. Yeah, so this, this is a polynomial of degree n, and I have a 2n dimensional smooth manifold, but it's an affine manifold, so it contracts until the half dimension, and these half numbers are the beta numbers. So in general, A pi m q is zero if m has a loop uh, by definition, and B pi m q is can be expressed as sum of its two minors or difference. If your chosen thing is not a co-loop, so ignore if you're not familiar, not very important. It means that it's not a loop in the dual matroid. C. If you compute the characteristic polynomial associated to direct sum of matroids, which corresponds to direct sum of vector spaces in the realizable case, that's a pi m1 q times pi m q. And any other invariant of m, say with value in a certain commutative ring, satisfying a, b, c, is a specialization. Of pi and q. Yes, yeah. You put a pro you plug in appropriate element of your commuted ring to Q. So let me just say a one word about this condition co-loop. It's not something serious. So co-loop in this case, let's say you have a collection of vectors, and being a co-loop means that your vector is contained in every basis. So when you're trying to delete and contract along that chosen thing, the deletion, the deleted matroid, has a smaller rank than expected. So deletion is supposed to have the same rank as m, but in this case, deleting a co-loop makes the whole arrangement rank goes down. So in the geometric picture, deleting a co-loop produces a certain vibration or as a C-star bundle. And when you want to uh, do the recursion for a co-loop, you're actually doing this. If you have a co-loop, your matroid is in fact a direct sum of Q. And you have to multiply by a C-star vibration vector, which is Q minus one. So as you could expect, the real conjecture is this. Conjecture D, Again, first for unimodality and then upgrade it to low concavity. Coefficients of 
characteristic polynomial of form a low concave sequence. for any m. And the basic implication is that this implies the conjecture on graphs, conjecture B, and conjecture on collection of vectors in a vector space. So there are a lot of quantifiers here, like for all matroids m, and you can ask whether b for that matroid implies, I'll not go into that, so everything works fine. But there is also something very, very new about conjecture d, which we weren't really didn't really care about in conjecture B and C. In that matroid, your matroid as an abstract combinatorial object need not have any realization as arrangement of vectors over any field of any vector space. Unlike B or C, every graphic matroid you can realize it as a collection of vectors with zero, one entries and conjecture C was they were about vectors in a vector space, but conjecture D is genuinely more general, especially if you ask about those matroids which has no realization. So um, the result I have obtained with Eric Katz is that, first of all, um, what I have written as conjecture A on the thing I call tropical Laplacian implies conjecture D for that matroid, the same matroid. And this conjecture, what would be a hot Riemann relation on a certain cohomology ring, holds for matroids realizable over some field. And the proof is basically the same as the first proposition I have shown you. If I'm given a matroid, and if I know it's realizable over some field, I use that realization to construct a certain algebraic variety and apply the hodge riemann And then you get the statement A, and that by elementary linear algebra implies D. So if you don't have a realization, that doesn't work. And we have computer verified that A holds for all matroids with at most nine elements. I guess there are about 300,000 non isomorphic matroids. Most of them are not realizable over any field. But still, they say it satisfy what would be a hot Riemann relation. So, uh, but if you remember, this Alexander Fenchel inequality on the mixed volume of convex bodies, and also Shepard's kind of converse that every low concave sequence arises that way, then of course you could prove conjecture D by constructing a pair of convex bodies with given sequence of mixed volumes, demonstrating that they are low concave. And Shepard's construction guarantees that such a 
approach will is guaranteed to work in principle. But uh, I have reasons to doubt that that will ever going to work for this problem. But uh, recently, Karim Adiprosito sort of Yeah, only over a field, yes, the usual field. But it, the problem does not change if you enlarge the, your algebraic object to something more general. So the conjecture is that almost all matroids are not realizable over any field or nor over any division ring, etc. But we don't know that, but uh, it appears so. And he will talk on this topic on this seminar, March 3. And by applying this polyhedral or convex geometric approach to conjecture D, and he showed that for all matroids, that are realizable as a C arrangement, Conjecture D holds. So C arrangement is a collection of subspaces of given vector spaces, so that any intersection among those collection of subspaces has a co-dimension, which is a multiple of a given number C. So if you're given a complex hyperplane arrangement, and if you view it as a real subspace arrangement, then it's a two arrangement because every intersection has co-dimension multiple of two. Well, still, they don't cover all matroids, and presumably almost all matroids are not realizable even as a C arrangement, but still, there are matroids which are not realizable in that classical sense, but which are realizable as a C arrangement. But, yeah. So if you're given a collection of subspaces, whose arbitrary intersection among the collection is a co-dimension multiple of two. That defines a matroid. But this is really a convex geometric approach, but the approach itself is not in the naive way I have just described. It just, of course, it doesn't straightforwardly construct two convex bodies, delta one and delta two, which manifestly shows this. I mean, you could expect the difficulty. The, if you want to show that something is the characteristic polynomial, you have to show that it satisfied this additive recursion, and that's kind of the only way you could do it. So, so this is my advertisement. So this should be a very fun talk. He uses measure concentration as your dimension of the convex bodies goes to infinity. And he shows that this recursion holds at the limit. Um, another project I'm running with Karim is to attack conjecture D by a constructing an appropriate combinatorial cohomology for which all this Caleb package remains true. So I'm going to give a quick and very non-standard brief introduction to tropical geometry. Describing the main objects. So, very briefly, algebraic, whenever you have an algebraic variety or embedded algebraic variety, you could apply certain degeneration procedure to get the tropical variety. And the hope is um, well, the classical theorems are of the form 
if you have a certain theorem applies to algebraic variety, then it has a combinatorial shadow of applied to tropical varieties. But now our main hope is that there are many tropical varieties that does not arise from tropicalizing algebraic varieties, but still you could have all the theorems that would be a shadow of the theorems in the algebraic variety. In particular, all these color packaged for tropical varieties. So now I'm going to introduce the tropical Laplacian. So I'm going to introduce it by comparing it to the classical Laplacian of a finite graph. So it's not really classical Laplacian, it's classical Laplacian of a graph. So let me just remind you, here you are given an abstract graph. And let's say you are given wij, which is a positive edge weight on G. And you define Laplacian to be the real symmetric matrix labeled by vertices of your graph, where ij entry is 0 if ij is not an edge and minus of the weight if ij is an edge and di for the diagonal entries where di is sum of edge weights where the sum is over all neighbors. So that Laplacian is in particular positive semi-definite unlike the tropical Laplacian that I'm going to introduce now. So the tropical Laplacian is associated to a tropical variety, but the, for the sake of introduction, I'm going to concentrate on tropical varieties of dimension two. You can view such an object as a graph, not as an abstract graph, but as a geometric graph. So I'm going to underline my G so to express the fact that it's a geometry graph. So it's a graph in all to the n with vertices which are vectors v1, v2, dot 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 kn, say distinct and non-zero. And then I'm going to consider edge weights, Wij, which are positive, but not only positive, but those edge weights which satisfies the so-called balancing condition. So balancing condition for the pair G and W means this. For each vertex, say vi, there is a real number, say di, not necessarily positive, such that vi times vi is a sum of always weighted neighbors. So this is a equality between two vectors. So it says that in particular, any vertex, say vi, is contained in the positive cone generated by its neighbors. And that's right, over all neighbors.
And as you could expect, I'm going to define the tropical Laplacian by saying that it's a real symmetric matrix, columns and rows indexed by vertices of my graph with zero entry on the non-diagonal corresponding to non-edge and minus edge weight corresponding to non-diagonal entry corresponding to an edge and di for the diagonal entries where di are the numbers di appearing in the balancing condition uniquely determined by it. So it looks pretty similar, in fact the same, except the definition of the diagonal entries. So here di is simply the sum of all its edge weights of all its neighbors, but here I take the vector, weighted vector sum. If you think of a collection of vector, no, ne not necessarily, but in all interesting examples they tend to be, but I don't require. So if you think of this graph, say a graph has a collect collection of vertices on a sphere in all n, and say that it's very, 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 very dense. So any vertex has its neighbors very close to it, then this equality degenerates to that. But even in that case, you cannot ignore the global effect of the balancing. And that effect will be reflected in the spectrum of Lij. di can be zero. So basic observation is that if you fix your geometric graph G, the set of positive balanced weights on G is a polyhedral convex cone in the very large space with basis generated by the vertices of G. So you have many, many linear equalities and then you require that your WIJ are positive so it cuts out a polyhedral cone. So let's run one example. <coughs> of how this set of positive balance weights looks like on a given very concrete G. So here's my G and it lives in all three. And it has eight vertices. which are the vertices of the cube, and the edges are drawn. So vertices, let's say they have coordinates plus minus one, plus minus one, plus minus one, so there are eight total. And I want to understand the set of all possible positive balance weights for this. But before making any computation, you know that if there is a positive balance weight for G, there is a unique one up to a multiple. Because if you look at the balancing condition at one of its vertices here, then it's, it has three neighbors which are linearly independent. So what you're trying to solve is a co-rank one system. So up to a multiple, there's unique way of solving the system locally. And then you solve the equation at the other vertex, and same thing applies here. Its set of neighbors are linearly independent, so if there is a solution, it has a unique one. And in this case, the previous edge weight of the previous edge is already determined, so that determines other edge weights, and this determination propagates. And in, under some dramatic conditions, they all agree, and the balance weight globally exists, which is indeed the case here. So, for example, 
balancing condition at say 1, 1, 1 amounts to solving or filling in the squares of this equation. And up to a multiple, the only way you can solve this equation is to plug in 1, 1, 1, and 1. And the same thing applies here. So it should be 1, 1, 1 here. Same thing applies here, 1, 1, 1 here. And everything agrees. Yes. But there is another very basic thing about this G, which is a, this is a graph of a polytope. So I'm going to go to that. So So G bar admits up to a multiple unique weight, positive and balanced. Which is indeed quite miraculous thing. So if you perturb your graph, say pick one of your vertex, and perturb it slightly by an epsilon amount while preserving the graph structure. And then you ask the same thing. Then it turns out that such a perturbed thing, let's say, does not admit any balanced weight, which is to be expected. You're trying to solve a highly overdetermined system of equations. So there are 12 edges. 12 variables and 8 vertices, 8 more variables corresponding to di. So in total, there are 20 variables. On the other end, equations that you're trying to solve, there is 3 for each vertex. So 3 times 8 is 24. So in general, there are no weights. Anyway, the Laplacian. In this case, is a symmetric matrix, 8 by 8 matrix, which is 0 for non-edge, minus 1 for edge, and 1 for diagonal entries. 1 coming from the balance equation here. So in this case, typical Laplacian was the graph Laplacian minus 2 times the identity. Because again, we have a 3 regular graph, but our diagonal entries are 1 instead of being 3. And the little proposition that you can try proving it directly is L has exactly one negative eigenvalue. And in fact, three zero eigenvalues. So this three is the three of all three. Yeah, all three. So this picture is drawn in all three. So again, because of this equality, in fact, the, what I have asserted here is same as saying that the graph, the abstract graph, this is a bipartite graph on four plus four vertices, has spectral gap two, which is not so easy. Um, Anyway, I want to explain what's so special about G as opposed to G prime. 
And the reason why it admits a positive balance weight at all is, in fact, in this case, is the G is the graph of a polytope, while G prime is not the graph of a polytope. So if you perturb this vertex slightly and take the convex hole, then you are forced to introduce new edge coming from the perturbed vertex in order to make the graph of a polytope. But that changes the graph you graph. So all the assertions I have made here was essentially known to Minkowski, expressed in different languages. So I'm going to explain you that. So um, uh, I'm going to start with a slightly easier case of one-dimensional tropical varieties, which I mean simply uh, a collection of vectors with weights. That is fine. So let's say you are, we're given a collection of vectors together with vertex weights, which satisfies this equality. And the amazing theorem of Minkowski in this case, concerning one-dimensional tropical varieties, collection of vectors with weights satisfying this, I'll end. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Then I'll end. So, suppose I have vectors, uh, the unit vectors, in all n, and I have positive real numbers, wi. Then the assertion is that there is a polytope, which is full dimensional if we i's are spanning all n. P inside all n, having Facet unit normals VI and corresponding facet volumes WI. Moreover, this P is unique up to a translation. Oh, sorry, I haven't finished the statement here. If and only if sum over wi of vi equals zero. So there are two assertions. If you have a polytop, full dimensional, you look at all its facet normals and compute the volumes of corresponding facets. Then you should have this. Conversely, if you are given unit normals and then and the weights, then you can find a full dimensional polytop with the given data. And the solution is unique up to a translation. So I would express this by saying that the study of one-dimensional tropical varieties is exactly the study of polytopes.
out. The situation gets really interesting if you go to two dimension. And let me state what Minkowski knew in my language. So he basically explains this example first, the difference between G and G prime. So the first statement goes like this. If G is the graph of a polytope, then it admits a positive balanced weight, edge weight. And its construction is sort of canonical or natural. It just depends on your G. And In interesting cases like this, where your polytope is simple, meaning that every neighbor of any vertex is linearly independent, by the argument I have shown you, if there is a weight, it's unique optomultiple. And that weight is what Minkowski constructs in this case. And he also knew that what I have called the tropical Abbasian. Let's say this weight is W of his weight, Minkowski weight, has exactly one negative value. So that explains the proposition applied there for cubes. So this way to construct is not too hard to explain given this. What you do is the following. You're given a polytop and how would you construct the edge weights? You look at the particular vertex and you look at the normal space spanned by the normals of that vertex. And that corresponds to a facet of the polytope dual to your thing G. And that facet has also co-dimension one faces, and each one has its areas. Those areas of co-dimension two faces of the dual polytope should satisfy this in the normal space which is our balancing condition here when expressed in the original space. So edge weights, in other words, Minkowski's weights are volumes of co-dimension two faces of the dual polytope of G, if your G is the graph of a polytope. And the assertion here is in fact what is used to prove the so-called brune minkowski theory, the primitive form of the alexander fengchel inequality I've shown you before. And both of them are really this hot riemann relation applied to a property of right variety. Um, actually, nothing happens here because if you yeah. <laughs> and n zero eigenvalues exactly if your polytope is three dimensional. Your n is 
n of t n k s plus Yeah, yes. Um, so, in fact, the Laplacian, my Laplacian, applies to functions defined on the vertices of the graph. And those n zero eigenvalues co corresponds to n vectors, which are coordinate vectors of the ambient space. Not necessarily simple. That's right. Well, it depends on, it really doesn't, the ambient toric variety you're applying, Hot Riemann, is not really important. That, that data gives me a line bundle, positive line bundle, on any toric variety which is fine enough to support that example. So, so I just want the toric variety whose span supports that one. Uh, but the main point is that there are many, many tropical varieties, starting from dimension two, that does not arise from polytopes. And that's one of the reasons why I believe that this old matroid conjectures on the incidence relations cannot be approached directly by constructing appropriate polytopes, at least in a natural way. So, um, so this is the reason why things become more complicated starting from dimension two. So let's say you have a tropical variety that, or tropical surface that I describe as a pair, G and W. So you have a geometry graph and positive balance edge weight. One such example, as Minkowski described, arise from by just putting a polytop, but what it really is, you can view such thing as a collection of polytops Pi living in the normal space of the ice vertex for each vertex. Because the conditions we have imposed, the balancing condition, exactly means that in the normal space of VI, we have this relation. So it defines, uniquely defines a polytope in the normal space. And the question is whether all these polytopes fits in together to form a one large polytope in Rn. That usually fails. Except in dimension three. So so here is a little miracle that I think everyone should know. Is when n equals 3, there is no obstruction to this patching problem. So if you're given a tropical variety, which is non-degenerate in a suitable sense, then it, it is always a polytop. All these polytops uh, produced in the normal space patches in together to form a single thing. So the statement is and is reconnected planar graph. There's a point. But that's a miracle that happens in dimension three. Starting from dimension four, you cannot patch these polytops in code dimension one to get a one big polytop. So perhaps this statement is what makes planar graphs so special. They can be always realized as a graph of a three-dimensional polytop, and such a Realizations always admits this very nice type of Laplacian, but that fails in general. Uh, reconnected means that you can, if you delete, if you remove any three vertices, the thing stay, remains connected. Yeah.
So that condition is there because any graph of a three-dimensional polytope is three-connected. This is a non-trivial theorem. I'm going to finish up by finally introducing the tropical Laplacian associated to a matroid. And this is indeed a very special class of tropical varieties. And we could view it as a tropical subvarieties of the so called permutohedron. So permutohedron is the convex rule of orbits of symmetric group Sn. You look at the point 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, 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 n. You apply all the permutations and take the convex rule. And you can view it as a tropical variety. And it contains, in a sense, many interesting tropical subvarieties, which governs all these incidence problems related to subsets of a given finite set. So let's fix our set, 0, 1, dot, 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 n. So that n will be the same n as before. And let's look at the space n-dimensional real space, which is the quotient of all n plus 1 mod out by 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Spanned by the vectors e0 to en corresponding to 0, 1 to n. We we'll say non empty proper subset S in E. Let's define ES as a sum of EIs where I runs over S. So basically, I'm going to look at a subset of E, non empty proper, as a vector, sum of the indicator vectors. And all these vectors are vertices of the polytope dual to the, what I call permutahedron. So if I have a collection of subsets, say non-empty and proper. I'm going to view it as a graph. The, its vertices are these vectors, ES, where S is a member of my collection. And edges are inclusions. So if I have many subsets of a given finite set, I look at the incidences between such sets as this graph. So, as you might believe, unless something miraculous happens, this geometric graph does not, there is no guarantee that it will admit a balanced weight. But in many interesting cases, they do. And we could use that weight, and it's associated to Laplacian, to extract many interesting information about the combinatorics of those instances.
So let's say a collection S1 dot 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 Sn of subsets of D is a D partition. If the size of each set is at least D, and each D element subset of E is in unique SI. So one partition is the usual partition. And you look at this collection formed by a D partition and all D minus one element subsets. So here's a basic observation on such collection. You can view it as a graph, and you notice that it's a bipartite graph. These are upper vertices, and these are lower vertices. And there are no edges between upper vertices and no edges between lower vertices. So G is a bipartite graph. And not only that, and it is balanced by constant weight 1. So let's check the balancing condition for the graph G associated to this D partition. There are two balancing conditions, first associated to one of the lower vertices. So it will look like this. So I have a D minus one element subset and all the SIs containing F. Because SI form a D partition, if you look at the set of all neighbors of F, then the key fact is that SI minus F Partition E minus F. In other words, if you pick any element not in F, there is unique SI among its neighbors, which contains that element. Or if you express this thing in another way, it says that if you take the sum of all the SIs over all the SI containing the given F, then that is a multiple of EF. In fact, that multiple is degree minus 1. Remember that if you take the sum over E0, E1, dot, 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 EN, then it's 0 by construction. So the expression written here is same as this. Well, there are other balancing conditions associated to upper vertex. So let's say if I have S and a set of neighbors F1, F2, say F5. But this case, balancing condition is even more easier. It says that if you take the sum of all the FIs, where the sum runs over all the FIs contained in S, since we are considering all D minus one element subsets, well, that's whatever, some multiple of ES. This is example of what matroid theory is called paving matroid. And it is conjectured that Almost all matroids 
are of this type. And hence, according to the other conjectures, almost all configurations of this type are not realizable over any field. So I do not know, in particular, how to prove this statement. The tropical Laplacian of the tropical variety that I have just constructed from a deep partition has exactly one eigenvalue, exactly one negative eigenvalue. Well, in general, what you can do is the following. So if you have a matroid on E, and then you consider the collection of rank K plus 1 flats of M and rank K flats of M. So this defines a bipartite graph. Rank K plus 1 on the one side, rank K on the other side. And you can again ask whether such a graph admits any balanced weight. Again, by some miracle that you have seen in here as a special case, it does. And it's, the answer is non-trivial, but still cannot be very it's not the constant weight 1, but you should give the weight which is given by the Mabius function. So, so there are again two sorts of balancing conditions. So balancing condition at lower vertex f, say rank k flat, well, locally, the linear equation is easy to solve. You look at all the rank k plus 1 flat containing f, then the, you note that ESI, if you look at all those SI containing f, is linearly independent. And by the same observation here, SI minus F should partition E minus F. If you think of vector configurations, if you pick a particular flat, then if you look at the flats of one dimension higher, which contains the given flat, that partitions the complement of the vector configuration. Sorry, that was complicated, but that's how matrix theory is. So in particular, if you put locally at F, you want to solve a linear equation of the following type, SI containing F. And by because of this condition, there is only one way you could solve it. And essentially, up to a multiple, the only solution is to put ones in here. That's the only solution. But the point is that you could take any multiple of this and get the balancing at F. So let's say weight F, weight F, weight F. F, weight F. And you do this solution for every lower flats. And the question is, how should you choose WF so that the balancing condition is also satisfied at all the upper flats? So that means that if you have S, you have to look at all its neighbors, then the edge weights are now all different in general. And the question is whether You could choose WF carefully so to achieve the balancing. So here is a little gem in the lattice theory, lattice in the poset sense goes back to Weissner 
in 1930s. Which says the following. Let S be a flat. E is any element of S. And Fi to be flat covered by S. And not containing then you have maybe its value of mu s is equal to the minus of the maybe its value of mu s i. So you have a flat, pick up a flat, pick any element, look at all flats immediately below the given flat, that does not contain the chosen element E, then the Mabius value at S is given recursively by this. In particular, the sum in the right-hand side is independent of the choice of E inside S you have used to define the collection Fi. But that is exactly the fact that was needed to solve the balancing equation. Well, so this is a first non-trivial theorem in lattice theory I have ever used. <laughs> but anyway, it, it is equivalent to the statement that if you choose the edge weights to be given by the value of the Mabius function of your post set at lower flats, then also at the upper flats, the balancing condition is satisfied. So if you take the vector sum weighted by the value of the Mabius functions, then Beisner theorem exactly expresses the fact that the balancing condition is full set, set by that S. And now I can make, yeah, well, in fact, the Mabius function as I have defined is sine alternating in rank, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. So now I have explained my conjecture A on tropical Laplacians of Matroid. Yeah, in fact, I have to apply this for each rank K. But the, as you know, only the interesting happens at the top because you can apply the same thing for 2K to the Matroid. The tropical Laplacian of Matroid constructing using this weight has exactly one negative eigenvalue. And that was the statement that was checked by a computer for many non-realizable matroids. And the, from here to the low concavity is actually a quite straightforward computation. So you have a, your symmetric square matrix or a quadratic form on a real vector space. And if you restrict the quadratic form to a certain universally defined two-dimensional subspace that I'm not going to discuss. You get another symmetric matrix of the form, let's say, um, A, B, D, C. 
And if you restrict something which has exactly one negative eigenvalue, then you get something which has at most one negative eigenvalue. So the determinant is of this thing. So that's where low concavity is coming from. But what's really behind the low concavity is the signature of a certain intersection matrix which lies behind all these combinatorial objects. So recently, actually, Karim and I have made some advances on really understanding what's going behind this thing. So we have constructed, given a tropical variety in this sense, not necessarily two-dimensional, we could construct using those only those combinatorial data, a certain cohomology ring, and the element in the top degree which would give the Poincaré duality, and we can also define in a combinatorial way the ample cone inside the degree one part of the cohomology, for which the hard Lipschitz and the hard Riemann are supposed to be true. So I hope to be able to present that at some other time, not in a too distant future. Um, and let me just finish by introducing one other conjecture of similar type, but of which I have no idea how to approach to. So this is actually, I think, more, more attractive to any mathematician, I guess. And it goes under the name of points, lines, planes conjecture. So this is again rota for unimodality and mason for low concavity. And I do not know how to prove even for realizable arrangement of vectors or hyperplanes over the real numbers or complex numbers. Nothing is known. Which is kind of unacceptable given the elementary nature of this statement. So let's say any arrangement planes, say in P3, over your favorite field, let's say complex numbers or real numbers, if you have finitely many planes, then intersection of two will give you a line, and intersection of independent three will give you many points. You count them all. So you have a certain number of planes, certain number of lines, certain number of points. And the conjecture is that number of lines squared is number of points and number of planes. Nothing is known over the real number. I, this is unacceptable. And here's an interesting quote from Joseph Kuhn, who worked on this for some time, uh, around the time 2000. And he stated that, among the many conjectures bearing Rota's name in matroid theory, this conjecture is perhaps the most intractable. I mean, it's hard to compare the difficulty of two open problems, but this seems to be quite deep, and almost nothing can be achieved by directly approaching to the statement by elementary methods of instance between points, planes, and lines. So, Perhaps this is also another manifestation of the Hodge theory, but I do not know even in the realizable case which algebraic variety should I look into to get this sort of inequality. So I'll stop here. <laughs>